We're very honored this morning to have the Honorable Judge Danny Boggs moderating this panel. Judge Boggs has been a judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit since 1986, where he was chief judge from September 2003 to August 2009. After earning his A.B. from Harvard in 1965 and graduating from the law school here at the University of Chicago in 1968, he transitioned on to the law school's faculty where he taught for a year. Judge Boggs later served in numerous roles in Washington, including assistant to the U.S. Solicitor General, assistant to the chairman of the Federal Power Commission, special assistant to the president, and deputy, deputy secretary of the U.S. Department of Energy before his appointment to the Sixth Circuit by President Reagan. Without further ado, Judge Boggs. Thank you. Um, our topic is current issues in patent law and policy. Uh, since I am on a regional court of appeals where we hear no patent cases and I have no particular patent background, at first I wasn't quite sure why they asked me to moderate this panel. <laughs> then I realized that uh, having been a, a student at the University of Chicago and faculty at the University of Chicago, uh, even during the blizzard of 67 when our classmates skied into uh, class from South Shore, they decided that at least I would be able to arrive and survive uh, in this weather. So taking that as my primary qualification, uh, I will move on. Um, as I say, I have no particular background, so when I looked at this, I thought at a very great generalist level, we're talking about property, and, and most of us think property is a, is a good thing, and the alienability of property uh, helps the system flow. At the same time, patents is a particularly special kind of property in that it's created by the government, even though the Constitution authorizes it explicitly. Uh, and so when the government creates things in various ways, we know that there can be problems and opportunities for rent seeking. So that uh, at the generalist level, it seems to me that that raises some interesting uh, questions uh, on both sides uh, that we'll hear about. Uh, obviously, the patent system also is supposed to and does drive innovation. I, I look out here and I think that there is almost certainly more computing power within the sound of my voice than existed in the entire world 30 years ago and probably less than 30 years ago. Uh, there is more information that each of you is, has available to you about your own DNA than was available for everyone in the world 30 years ago. So if the patent system uh, drives that, uh, the best patent system can advance it or retard it. Uh, changes in the patent system can advance or retard that innovation, which means that's why it's a very important topic. We have four distinguished panelists to speak on this. I will, uh, since you can't always tell the panelists without a scorecard, I will uh, uh, introduce them all at one time. You have a more complete listing uh, in your program, but I will mention just a few salient points, I think. Ms. Phyllis Turner Grimm will be our first speaker, is currently the Chief IP Counsel of Intellectual Ventures, which is a, a, a company headquartered in a, in a small, obscure suburb called Bellevue, Washington, not far from the headquarters of a small, obscure company called Microsoft that uh, many of the Intellectual Ventures people uh, had connections with. I, I found she has also served across a fantastic range of the highest uh, aspects of the American corporate scene, from having been an intellectual property attorney for the Amico Corporation, having been assistant general counsel for IP at Walmart, and having been a technical leader at both General Electric and Procter & Gamble. She holds a BS in chemical engineering and a JD. From their background, perhaps uh, with an opposing point of view on some issues, we'll have Professor Michael Moyer, uh, who is a professor at Boston University Law School, having previously been both an economics professor and a law professor. He has lectured uh, and testified on antitrust and patent licensing issues around the world. He holds a JD and a PhD in economics. Uh, we then will have Professor D Douglas Melamed, I think of him as the old head on the panel. Uh, he is currently a professor at Stanford Law School, but before that, he was general counsel of the Intel Corporation. He was the chair of the antitrust practice at Wilmer Hale. He was acting assistant attorney general of antitrust. 
and he wrote a seminal law review article with uh, Professor Guido Calabresi, before he was Judge Guido Calabresi, uh, on uh, various types of property and <coughs> alienability that is thought of as a seminal work in the area of law and economics and property. Well, if he is the old head, then the rising uh, young kid is uh, Adam Mortera, who was, born <laughs> <laughs> who was born sometime after the seminal article uh, was published. <laughs> Tara is a partner at the firm of Bartlett Beck, firm of Ellen Sharon Scott, but is also a lecturer of law here at the University of Chicago, uh, where he was named the Lecturer of the Year, which, uh, given the competition, is a pretty high honor. Uh, he also holds a, a Bachelor of Science from the University of Chicago, uh, an MA as a Marshall Scholar, and a JD. Uh, we'll turn it over to uh, Ms. Turner Brim as our first speaker. trials 
at the, in the Patent Office, seems to be achieving his goal of directing certain litigants and issues to the USPTO's Patent Trial and Appeals Board for resolution as an alternative or certainly um, to shortcut litigation in the federal courts. In general, the rate of patent litigation is at or below historical trends, and the percentage of litigation filed by so-called non-practicing entities, patent assertion entities, or if you like the pejorative term, patent trolls, um, is in line with this, it continues to represent 17 to 20 percent of the patent litigation out there. And this is with reference to the number of issue patents. A recent study by Katropia, Hassan, and Schwartz found that the perceived increase in NPE litigation, and NPE is shorthand for non practicing entities for those, for the uninitiated, <laughs> is driven by primarily by the joinder rules which were revised in the American Defense Act. Courts, including the Supreme Court, have provided judicial policy guidance on many of the issues that have been identified as problematic in patent infringement cases. Fee shifting, inequitable conduct, end user protection, questionable subject matter protection. Patents are not killing innovation or tech entrepreneurs. In 2013, venture capital funding soared to its highest level since <coughs> since the uh, peak of the dot-com bubble in 2000, and patent filings and issuances have never been higher. The vast majority of patent, <coughs> patent, pat, the vast majority of patent activities, such as licensing and transfers, happen outside of the courts, and thus litigation statistics paint an incomplete and frequently misleading picture of the patent marketplace. So with that background, I'll turn to some of the things that were mentioned concerning this particular panel and your materials. Should the one-size-fit-all model for patent duration be altered for certain kinds of patents or subject matter? No. The software industry, the uniform patent model for duration has worked for some 200 years, and it appears to continue to be worked. The software industry does not seem to be stifled by the current patent duration. Technology advances at a regular pace, and actually designing around existing technologies is one of the many ways to advance the useful arts, which is one of the primary, the primary purpose of the patent system. It's not clear that technology is moving so fast that it makes the current patent term unworkable with regard to how long, industry, how long technology stay in place. For example, the 802.11 standard, which is the Wi-Fi standard, has been around for more than a decade. While it has been modified in some respects, so forth and so on, it continues to be one of the most widely used technologies, and it continues to be also one of the most highly litigated. A strong patent system is needed to support R&D investment and new innovations, in my view, particularly, for example, in pharmaceuticals. Should business methods be patentable? Yes, if they rise to the level of patentability. Right? Um, business methods, and I'm going to substitute for that software patents because that's frequently what people are getting at when they say business method patents. They're getting at software patents. Software is an immensely important arena of innovation, and it is thriving. The distinction between software and hardware inventions isn't clear and can be illusory. Computer engineering experts will tell you that software should be treated differently because many of the things that used to be achieved through hardware modification are now achieved through software. Say, for example, with field programmable Gatorades, FPGAs. Software patents are not playing the courts. They, send, they tend to represent the same 10 to percent of patent lawsuits. Software patents are not necessarily a poor quality, but quality can always improve. Um, courts have upheld software patents generally 80% of the time, and of course there's recent guidance from the CLS v. Alice case relating to Section 101 in patentable subject matter. So we'll continue to see more um, issues around 101 and software as, as a patentable subject matter in that arena. Software patents tend to be, and can be, but can be, valuable late in life. 
And this is evidenced by the percentages that are retained to their full term. So, should the USPTO be split or reorganized? The Patent Office does a good job with the resources it has. Of course, there's always room for improvement. You know, as Judge Fives mentioned, I come from a chemical engineering background. And one of the many things, <coughs> certainly in, in all engineering, but particularly in chemical engineering, we focus on engineering the quality in instead of inspecting the defects out. And currently, one would say that the patent office is in the old style, where we're inspecting the defects out instead of building the quality in. So there does need to be more investment in the patent office. It needs to be fully funded. Its fees should not be diverted. Um, there are certain things that perhaps should be examined around processes and training. And there is a lot of um, activity going on right now in terms of training examiners with regard to the one and the new CLS VL standards. And perhaps the office could look at something um, along the lines of requested examination. Currently in the US Patent and Trademark Office, if you file a patent application, a non-provisional utility application, it will be examined, whether you want it to or not. Once you, once you file and you pay your filing fee and you complete your particulars, it will be examined. There are some places in the world where that patent will not be examined unless you request it to be examined. So there's a possibility if we wanted to reduce, say, for example, the pendency of patent applications, which now can range anywhere from two to six or eight or nine years, um, we reduce the number of patents being examined by requiring that the applicant request that. That will give the applicant time to determine whether the technology is one they want to pursue. Because now we have a first inventor to file system, which incentivizes filing <coughs> early and filing often. So perhaps we could do something on the other side of that. And we, of course, as I said, we need continued guidance on examining procedures, not only within the software area, but in all areas of the patent office. Because there are, there are patents that should not be issued in all arts areas. So whatever we can do to support examiners is something that should be done. So with that, I'm going to take my seat and let you hear from the rest of the panel. Thank you very much. You came in right under the 12 minutes, which I told every, everyone to keep. And as a federal appellate judge, I'm not quite used to cutting people off, so. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Moyer has five minutes. I'm going to give him a five minute warning. I guess. I'll, I'll be problematic. He has so. show and tell, so. <laughs> go, go to, sir. So, go I want to apologize to Phyllis for leaving the subliminal message on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but like Phyllis, um, I think that uh, innovation policy is critical in determining the pace of innovation. And as she said, innovation is critical in determining economic growth rates. Uh, that's why I'm here today to evangelize uh, a research agenda that I've been working on for about a decade. Um, as uh, Phyllis suggested, there are people out here who are reformers. I'm one of those reformers. So she doesn't like the reformers that rely on anecdote, and I don't either. So um, I think that most of my work I like some good anecdotes, but most of my work goes beyond that and, and offers some uh, econometrics or some kind of data to help build a case for reform. Uh, so, um, unlike Phyllis also, I'm not going to talk about NPEs. I can't, I can't uh, change the lights, sorry. Uh, NPEs are not my focus today. I want to talk about something that is deeper in the patent system that creates problems that existed before NPEs became very active. I think it's really important to understand what's wrong with the patent system, to understand problems that pre-existed uh, the wave of NPE litigation that started around 2005. Uh, so that's my mission. Um, what I hope to persuade you is that the patent system uh, actually taxes innovators in most industries, notably though not chem and pharma, and the basis of this problem is low patent quality. The quality, though, is relatively good in chem form. There are three kinds of quality problems that reformers have identified. Number one, mistakes by patent offices and courts. I won't say much about that. Uh, secondly, the inventive step, which we call the non-obviousness requirement in our patent system, is too low. That means that valid patents are granted on 
uninteresting and low quality inventions. I won't have much to say about that either. My concern is, as I said, to evangelize about patents failing to be property. And, and I use the label notice failure to emphasize that kind of quality problem. So um, as Phyllis uh, observed, we are uh, in the midst of some activity the, uh, geared to reform and improve our patent system. Uh, the first focus of reformers was on the mistakes that I talked about. Uh, we've gotten a little bit better. I don't think, though, that's had a significant beneficial impact. Uh, recent reforms also focus on mitigating harm caused when low quality patents are asserted. I think there we have made a bit of progress. Uh, possibly we have a new waiver reform coming that will address notice problems. Some of that might be done in Congress. Some of it might be done in the PTO. I hope and I think that much of it will be done by courts. And I hope that you people in the audience as clerks for appellate judges or Supreme Court justices can help to influence uh, lawmakers. Um, the way that um, uh, Chicago antitrust had a significant impact on the shape of antitrust law. Um, I think that we have the same potential for improvement of the patent system through better decisions by our judges. So, to the nitty gritty, what do I mean by notice failure? Um, I've got White Acre and Yellow Acre, and I own White Acre and I want to build an office tower. <coughs> I've got my surveyor out there, I take a look at the deeds, I talk to my lawyers, and I build this office tower on White Acre. Uh, rarely do we see the alternative where I accidentally build a little bit onto Yellow Acre. I could negotiate to purchase some of that yellow land in advance, or I can rely on technology to make sure that my property stays over on the white side of the line. Um, as you look through case law in real property, you hardly ever see these sorts of disputes occurring. That's because we have good notice associated with the law of land. Technology development, though, is different. Strangers often fail to take notice of patent rights, they fail to license before investing in new technology, which makes them vulnerable subsequently to hold up, and they miss the opportunity to avoid infringement by designing around a patent. As a consequence, most people who are sued for patent infringement are inadvertent infringers. infringers. They're not pirates. Um, defendants typically invest more in R&D than plaintiffs do. They typically own more patents than the plaintiffs do. Um, they are almost never shown to have copied. They're using technology that was independently developed. And the econometrics shows us that when we control for the size of the defendant, number of employees, market capitalization of the defendant, a very good predictor of the probability you will be sued for patent infringement is how much you spend on R&D. The more you spend on R&D, the more likely you are to be sued as a patent infringer because investing in R&D is what exposes you to a patent lawsuit. That's crazy. Uh, there are three causes of notice failure. First, where is the property right? There's a lack of transparency in our patent system. Um, some patent holders uh, have shell companies where they own patents, but it's difficult for outsiders to tell who the owner is. That's one kind of transparency problem. Probably a more serious transparency problem is illustrated by the patent dispute between RIM and NTP. RIM, you might know, is a company that makes the BlackBerry. Um, and the problem that RIM faced is that when they were innovating, there were patent rights subsequently asserted against them that they just could not see at the time they were innovating. Lazaridis founded RIM, invented wireless email. Campana also invented wireless email, and so did three other people all around the same time. Campana tried and failed to commercialize. RIM learned about the NTP patents that were acquired from Campana 10 years after it started development. Uh, NTP sued RIM for patent infringement and under threat of injunction, RIM settled with NTP for $612 million. Problem number one. Problem two, where are the owners? Um, as I said, uh, with much NPE litigation, it's difficult because of shell companies to tell who owns patents. 
but before 2005, before MPE litigation was very significant, it was already hard to tell who has a patent that might be asserted against you. Here's some data from research I did with Jim Besson that indicates that when you look at a practicing entity suing another practicing entity in patent litigation, um, that 28% of the time there is no industry overlap between the parties. We also looked at their patent portfolios and found that they were distant from one another in technology space as well. Add to that the huge number of patents in some sectors, Doug's going to talk about that, it becomes very difficult to read patents. In fact, it becomes a crushing burden to really try to read all of the property rights that might be asserted against you. Next, where are the boundaries or what are the boundaries? Chemicals are claimed by what they are and they provide good notice. Uh, other inventions generally are claimed by what they do and that style of claiming tends to provide poor notice. Here's an example. A man named Freeney invented a retail kiosk that would produce music recorded on cassette tapes. The kiosk was connected to a remote computer. This was pre-internet, dedicated hard line. The patent claim language was well-written. A skillful patent attorney uh, used abstract language that possibly covered all sales over the internet, mm -hmm. even though the attorney probably did not even dream the internet would exist. Poor notice existed because the language in the claim was unstable. The word material object might in 1980 have meant cassette tape. By 2000, it would mean hard drive. Point of sale location probably meant near the cash register or at the cash register in Tower Records, but by 2000, it meant in your bedroom where your PC was located. Uh, as a consequence of the inadvertent infringement which generates um, a huge volume of patent litigation, we have a tale of two different kinds of technology served poorly or well by the patent system. So Besson and I took a look at the profits associated <coughs> from the worldwide patent portfolio of publicly traded American firms in the chemical and pharmaceutical industry, and if you look at the dash line at the top, you see the rents that they capture. And you look down at the bottom and you look at aggregate U.S. litigation costs to alleged infringers in those same industries, and you see a really big gap between those two, which indicates that patents end up net subsidizing research and development activity in those sectors. By contrast, take a look at all other industries. The dashed line shows the rents or the profits delivered to patent owners, American publicly traded firms. The solid line are the costs associated with patent enforcement activity. You see it was a wash from 84 to 94, but from 94 up to 99, costs shot way up. Uh, recent research I wasn't involved in extended this to the last two decades, the same, re two, yes, last two decades. Same result continued, uh, probably 15 years, last 15 years. Um, the same result continues to hold true. That other people's patents are more of an annoyance to me, impose greater costs on me, than I capture benefit from owning my patents. I still want my patents, they still deliver benefit to me, but the problem is other people's patents are going to be asserted against me in a way that I can't avoid. Uh, so remarkably enough, I guess I'm done before my time is up. So I, I hope, oh, I'm not quite done. I, I won't say more, maybe I'll leave this slide up here. Here are the answers to my, my answers to four questions that uh, Phyllis talked about. Um, we don't have to have one size fits all in terms of duration because we can use renewal fees to effectively make the life of a patent shorter if we strategically use license fees or renewal fees. I mean, for example, um, high renewal fees for information and communications technologies. Um, business processes, should those be patentable? No. Some kinds of inventions cannot be effectively propertized by the patent system. Uh, what about the patent office? We need to use our extremely scarce resources more sensibly, more strategically, uh, change the way that we examine ICT patents as compared to pharma patents, devoting more time to 
clarity of the property rights when it comes to software. And lastly, um, we know very well that for most kinds of technology, the patent is maybe only third or fourth or fifth most important as a source for appropriating value from R&D. <laughs> It was said that Chief Justice Rehnquist cut off the Dean of the New York State Bar in the middle of the word, if. <laughs> I didn't quite do as badly. Um, and uh, for our other two speakers, I will we'll say at least in our court, if someone puts up a visual aid, uh, we tell them the opposing side can have it taken down before the argument continues. So uh, you have the privilege to have them <laughs> take it down if you wish or not. Professor Mellon. I'm talking about if you're not interested in what I'm saying. Um, I don't have slides. I, I thought I'm moving to the right or the left, but I'm more comfortable in the center, so pardon me. <laughs> Look, um, the purpose of patents is to create incentives for innovation and invention. And a sound patent policy that depends not only on the articulation of the boundaries of the, of the patents and addressing and resolving some of the questions that might differ, but also on the remedies that are provided in the case of patent infringement. Uh, if you own white acre or yellow acre and you know we can prevent trespasses, it's, it's obviously of best value to you. Um, if the remedies are inadequate for a patent holder, uh, we're going to have insufficient incentive for innovation and invention. If the remedies are excessive, if patent holders are, are recovering too much for their inventions, uh, we then have a tax, inefficient tax on uh, development of new products, uh, innovation, building on prior inventions, uh, and, and of course a, uh, a tax on consumers. Uh, and we also create perverse incentives for innovation, are in the uh, patenting for the purpose of developing an arsenal to, to, de to, to gain them um, uh, undeserved remedies rather than for the purpose of inducing efficient innovation. So the, 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 the task is to find an optimal uh, a, a remedy, patent remedies. Now, patent remedy law, uh, often explicitly and certainly implicitly, assumes a paradigmatic world in which there is what I'm going to call a guilty infringer. In this world, imagine uh, uh, Edison, Thomas Edison invents an incandescent light bulb and gets a patent on it. And at that point, he has three options. He can put the patent in the door and ignore it as most patents are ignored. He can choose to exploit the patent himself and make light bulbs, or he can license others, either selectively or broadly. Uh, to, uh, to uh, exploit his technology. And if he chooses to license, would-be licensees themselves have a number of options. They can take a license. They can design around by trying to figure out a way to develop an incandescent light bulb that does not infringe the Edison patent. They can go into, a, into some other business like fluorescent light bulbs, and they can you know, make bullows or something else. And, if, and in making the choice as to which option to pick, the would-be licensee uh, looks at the, at the relative value of the options, and if the patent is taking the license option is the most valuable, it will take a license, provided that the royalty that it has to pay for the the license is not in excess of the, of the increment in value of that option compared to the next best alternative. That increment is the maximum amount the would-be licensee will pay for a license. And if he agrees to a license in that circumstance, because he had the option of walking away from the transaction, one can look at that and say, well, that's a market price. That reflects the value of the invention. The problem is that that paradigm on which patent damages law is built doesn't apply very much in the modern world, certainly not in the information technology world. The cell phones that all you have in your pockets uh, include technologies that are claimed by an estimated 250 to 300,000 different patents. It is inconceivable that the manufacturer of a, of, a, of a cell phone could identify all of those patents before making the cell phone, partly because there are too many that to search and probably as many of them have been issued in the form of um, pending applications and haven't even published them. And if he could identify all of them, there's no way he could negotiate a license in advance of 300,000, the holders of 300,000 patents, partly because of the numbers and partly because each one of those holders, knowing that the licensee had to get a license in advance, if that were the law, would hold out for an, an, an excessive share the way the last guy who holds out uh, when they're building a highway unless you have the eminent domain. And then finally, um, uh, the, the, the relentless demands of the market and the consumers for more and more innovation make it inconceivable 
that we would have a world in which we expected um, technology users to get pre-clearance on all these patents before innovating, because if you did that, you bring, you bring the innovation process forward. So what you have instead in the IT industry, in many industries other than maybe pharma and chemicals, is a, uh, a well-established pattern of infringe now and settle up later. And that's socially optimal. We wouldn't want it any other way in those industries. So the question then is, if, you're, if you infringe now and settle up later, how do you determine damages? And the problem with the current determination of damages, mindlessly applying the, the paradigm of the guilty infringer to this world of the innocent infringer, if I can use that term, is that, is that they, the patent remedies systematically result in excessive damages. They do it for the following reasons. First of all, um, let's look at the market tra uh, transactions that might be entered into after the fact. After the fact, the developer of the phone has no option to walk away. He has to pay damages for past infringement, and he probably doesn't want to walk away from his investment because of lock-in problems. That is to say, at this point, the alternative is worth a great deal less to him because he'd have to incur extra costs or re-incur re -incur costs already incurred to switch to an alternative. So the delta, the difference between the value of consistent, uh, persisting using the uh, in, uh, infringing technology and using the best, next best alternative has grown, so the amount he would pay for a license is much larger than it was if he had the walk away option in the paradigmatic case. Now look what happens in litigation. First of all, courts look at these licenses added into ex post, that is to say after infringement, as if they reflected market value. They don't, and I'll explain why in a moment, but they certainly reflect an inflated value. So litigation biases upwards because A, it's looking at, 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 at uh, uh, licenses that have an inflated value, because there's no way in a four or five day trial you can ever try all 300,000 patents in order to determine the actual incremental value of the patent in suit. And because of what's called an anger effect, psychologists and, and, and economists have identified, namely if you have a trial for five days focusing on the patents in, in suit, its value relative to the other contributors to the value of that cell phone will be systematically exaggerated. So litigation results are going to be exaggerated. Now, what happens to, the, to, to, to these uh, uh, license agreements that are entered into outside the courts that are used by the courts in turn to determine a benchmark for value? They are inflated because they're not market prices. They're, those uh, the licenses are entered into in the shadow of litigation because at that point, the infringer does not have the option of walking away, and everybody knows if they don't reach an agreement, they're going to go to court. So the, 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 the so-called agree or, uh, or like a, price in the license is, in fact, a regulated price driven by a prediction as to what the government, the court, will determine is applicable in that case. So you have a vicious cycle of um, uh, excessive agreed upon prices, excessive litigation results that reinforces uh, grossly excessive rewards to patent holders, which in turn has uh, all of the bad consequences I talked about before including excessive patenting and the fact that there are 300,000 patents in the form is evidence of that, it's a classic public choice problem. Everybody now is going to the government to get a patent because they're all red suits. Okay, what's the solution? Solution is to develop a way of thinking about patent remedies that distinguishes between the case of the guilty infringer, the Edison paradigm, and the case of the innocent infringer, the IT world as we know it today, and also distinguishes between the willing licensor, that is to say the patent holder who just wants money, and the unwilling licensor, the patent holder who would go back to the innocent example and actually said, no, thank you, I'd rather be the only one exploiting my patent. So you have a matrix. Innocent, um, willing, is unwilling, guilty, willing, guilty, unwilling, and you can uh, think about what the appropriate remedy is uh, in, in terms of that matrix, if we had more time, if you remarried, whenever it comes out, uh, what that is. Um, uh, but but uh, the key point is to remember that in, in, in any dollar remedy, it is critically important that the courts and the law focus entirely on what the ex ante bargain would have been, what the bargain would have been if this had been a rule like the paradigmatic rule where there was a true market price, where, in other words, the infringer had the option of walking away, and that it ignored all of the ex post after infringement events, lock in and the shadow of litigation that lead to excessive rewards to patent holders.
to that joke about sitting in the center and looking to the right, I was going to stay seated, but now I'm going to look to the right. <laughs> Signaling, anger. <laughs> First, I'd say it's a great honor, and I'm very proud to be here at my own alma mater and the law school with which I'm loosely affiliated to talk to you today about something I know something about, which is patent law. Usually, and I see many of my current and former students in the audience, usually I talk to you about things that I am not really an expert in, the jurisdiction of federal courts and criminal procedure. Finally, I get to talk about what I do for a living, which is litigate patents. Um, in the trenches, in the areas that were just described, I'm going to talk to you about the area that seems to get a pass, which is pharmaceutical and chemical patents. I want to talk about that because I'm going to give you the radical idea, I'm going to talk about two developments there, give you the radical idea that we should get rid of pharmaceutical patents. Uh, the one place that got the exemption from the other speakers, I think we should ditch them, and I represent pharmaceutical companies. So what am I talking about? First, <laughs> the pharmaceutical industry is important here because as industry forces move in patent law, the pharmaceutical industry is the one industry segment that is very, very vigorously pro-patent. The IT people, the Amazons, they're trying to kill patents. The pharmaceutical industry needs them. Why? It's because of the way that generic substitution works in America. In America, we give pharmaceutical companies a very limited amount of time to sell a new drug free of generic competition. In many cases, five years for new chemical compounds. In other cases, only three years. And what happens after that is that a company that did zero research and development, literally zero, ran one clinical trial with 20 people in it, gets to come on the market, and what do they do? They steal 90% of the innovator's sales in a week, and they're gone forever. That is what happens when there's been hundreds of millions of dollars spent on research and development by pharmaceutical companies. Five years later, if the patents don't hold up, the generics on the market with 90 to 95% of the sales in a week. That happens every day in America because of mandatory generic substitution laws. The difference between having patent protection and not having it at that five-year or that three-year mark can be billions and billions of dollars of expected revenue. Uncertainty over the validity or the enforceability of patents creates massive uncertainty in investment that is that it's at a level that dwarfs any of our ability to comprehend the large numbers that are involved. And I've sat in a room where decisions like this are made. Are we going to continue to promote this product? How good is the patent? Hundreds of millions of dollars going on patents where the best that a lawyer can say, and I'm not saying it was me, is we have a 50-50 chance of winning this one. <laughs> so with so much money in a cap very capital-intensive industry, there's a lot of potential social inefficiency. One that gets mentioned a lot in the press is that pharmaceutical companies gain a compliant USPTO to get patent protection on small developments, small inventions that don't represent real medical advances, and instead serve only to further block generic competition. Of course, generic competition can be good. If there's nothing innovative behind a new drug. Generic competition brings in lower prices, which is a social good. But if there is something innovative, we can protect it. The problem is the PTO is not really the best place to decide what's innovative in medicine at least in a world where the United States Food and Drug Administration is the gatekeeper to whether you can sell a drug at all. We're not here to debate whether that's a good idea. <laughs> the risk profile associated with the uncertainty about patents leads to further allegedly harmful behavior, which includes settlements between generics and brand name manufacturers that the FTC, perhaps over-enthusiastic FTC, and hyper-enthusiastic plaintiffs and trust lawyers say violate the Sherman Act, and subsequent litigation of this type has exploded since the Supreme Court's decision in FTC versus Actavis, which adopted in some form the Federal Trade Commission's longstanding and eccentric position that you could actually violate the Sherman Act while you were the holder of a lawful novel. So what's the solution? As I said at the beginning, the solution is get rid of the patents. We don't need patents to protect pharmaceutical innovation. What we do need is an extension of the statutory or data exclusivity award that pharmaceutical companies get when their new drug product is approved. Right now, we have three or five. We're amongst the shortest in the world. In Europe, it's much longer for new products. We should extend that period to something more like 12 years. What pharmaceutical companies are getting now for biosimilars, uh, for biologic inventions, for biosimilars to come on the market, we should give to pharmaceutical companies 
for their small molecule innovations. What would this do? We'd get certainty. A pharmaceutical company would know. They can get their product approved by the FDA. And that is a very hard process, and many products do not make approval. If they can get their product approved, they have 12 years, free and clear, to sell their product. And after that, it's going to go generic. And everybody would know what the deal was. Everybody would know how to put their money on the table. And the US consumer would be greatly benefited. Why? Because we have more great new medicines to help heal society. We would minimize antitrust litigation. The costs associated with this antitrust litigation are now extensive. And you can see the settlements every day. If you get IPR 360, you can see these settlements coming in at the tens and tens of millions of dollars lined with pockets of plaintiff's antitrust lawyers and doing no real benefit for the US consumer. Only people that lose from getting rid of patents here are the lawyers. You can think about this it's outsourcing innovation detection to the FDA, to the actual doctors, and taking away that role from the USPTO, who, as one of my clients would say, is full of propeller heads, who decide things on the basis of something called inventive step that you have no idea what we're talking about. <coughs> with the FDA. And speaking of the social harm represented by lawyers, I want to take a moment to talk to you about something that happened just a couple weeks ago, which is, which is serious social harm created by lawyers. Uh, the Interpartist Review System uh, created by the American Vets Act, I think I would call it right. I would call it a blight because now the patent office has two sides of the house. One side that grants every patent that walks in the door, and the other side that kills every patent that comes into litigation. And it doesn't make a lot of sense, the system that we have now. The IPR process is getting instituted 86% of the time. It is, it is a noteworthy and newsworthy event when a patent actually escapes, is reaffirmed. Affirmed is valid in the IPR process. Something is already wrong with it. The IPR process for those unfamiliar, it's called interpartist review. It's the trials in the patent office that were referred to earlier. It's a blight. It's even worse now. Let me tell you a story about Accorda Therapeutics. They're a small drug company. They have one product. It's an MS therapy. Everybody knows what MS is. It's a terrible disease. And Accorda has a product called Empira, which is helping patients with MS. Recently approved, enormous drug. One product, basically, this company. Well. What did our friend Eric Spangenberg do? And some of the panelists, I think, probably know Eric Spangenberg. Eric Spangenberg made his name in NPE litigation. And he decided that what he was going to do was he was going to file an interpartist review uh, petition on Accorda's main patent on this great new product. And why did he do it? He told us why he did it. He did it to move their stock price. And he did. In one day, 10% change in Accorda's stock price. He shorted the stock, and him and his investors made a lot of money. There is absolutely no way this is socially optimal behavior. And this is just the beginning of the abuse of the reforms that the AIA brought about. We're going to see it more and more. Nobody can think of anything that's illegal about what Mr. Spangenberg and his investors have done. So before Congress considers adding more reforms that hurt patent rights, they might consider getting rid of patents for pharmaceutical companies and making greater certainty in an area where we need innovation. And they might consider turning back the dial a little bit on some of the things they did to hurt patent holders in the American Vets Act. Thank you. Our, our panelists did a, a wonderful job uh, holding to their time limits, so I'm going to give them each a strict two minutes to chime in on anything that went before, and then we'll turn it loose on the audience. Ms. Turner Grimm? Um. I guess I'll just um, sort of tag along on what my colleague on the far left. <laughs> but I'm on your right. <laughs> um, spoke about the need to evaluate the current workings of all the reforms that were uh, implemented in the AIA before engaging in additional reform. Um, clearly, I won't weigh in on what's wrong, what's right, so forth and so on. But what I will say is this, that these are very new proceedings. They're new proceedings, period. They're new in the Patent Office, and the Patent Office is needing to find its way in this regard. So the question is, is there really an urgent need for additional reform versus evaluating the current reform and making sure that they're achieving goals? 
I've got uh, three comments. One uh, follows on something Doug said. Um, all of you folks out there who are using one of these, you are all infringers. Uh, everyone in this room is an infringer because use of there is an infringement. Well, second order is well, sort of Not if they're Apple patents, because, because <laughs> Apple exhausted its patent rights when it sold you the phone. So don't worry about Apple's patents. <laughs> don't bank on that. <laughs> second, second comment. Uh, uh, Phyllis was talking about the Catropia study that talked about uh, the change in patent litigation between 2010 and 2012. Um, I don't disagree with the results in that study. I want you, though, to notice that um, the level of patent litigation in the year 2014, it declined from 2013, but it was twice as high as the year 2009, and much higher than that compared to the previous baseline. So we've seen a little bit of decline in patent litigation in the past year. It is still a flood, still really, really high levels. Last comment, uh, also connected to this, something Phyllis said. Um, our economy is incredibly innovative. We're really successful in innovating, but that doesn't justify a tax. It doesn't make any sense at all. Back in the 1870s, when we saw lots of troll activity, that was another period of time when our economy was successful, we were innovating a lot, and naturally that drew the rent seekers who tried to tax the successful innovators. We're seeing the same thing again today. Uh, uh, three very uh, short comments, just uh, uh, one for each of the uh, other speakers. As to Phyllis's comment, Phyllis talked a lot about uh, how we have a patent system and we have a very innovative, uh, uh, robust economy. That's true. And, and I don't think anybody here <coughs> suggests we should do away with the patent system. That's not the question. The question is how do we calibrate the patent system so that it, it, it's optimal rather than suboptimal. For example, Phyllis said <coughs> there's a, a huge amount of, of um, uh, VC funding of innovative uh, activity and it's increasing. That's true, but a new study like done last year by Catherine Chester and MIT estimates that VC support of startups would have been $22 billion more in the last five years than it hadn't been uh, for, for patent assertion entities. So um, we're not at the optimal point, although we may be better than we would be if we had no patents at all. Uh, secondly, as to, as to what uh, President Murray said, um, the issue of the uncertainty of patents is hugely important. Um, it has all sorts of ramifications, the ones he spoke about surely are central to it, but it also relates to the remedy question. It's one of the reasons why um, uh, damages uh, are so much greater than they ought to be, because it's so hard to get a fact finder to focus precisely on the validity and infringement and, and, and scope of a patent and its con incremental contribution to the, to the embodiment and instantiation of it. And it's one of the reasons that patent injunctions are often a, a, a misguided remedy because they shut down not just the infringing technology, but the other 299,999 that are used in the device. Um, and thirdly, as to, as to uh, uh, Adam, I don't know enough about, about the pharmaceutical law to make any knowledgeable comment to a group this large um, about, um, about the specific proposal. But, but the, the bashing of the, uh, of the reform statute, I don't entirely disagree with it at all. I think it's a crappy statute. It's a crappy statute because of the feeding frenzy in Congress. Frankly, if the reformers had gotten their way, it would have been a better law because it would have done something substantive. What happened is all the compromises and the pushback of the, um, uh, those who, who believe that we shouldn't do anything to change the, the, the patent world as we know it now, and that resulted in a, resulted in a crappy compromise. Thank you. Lord Karen? Since I now get to rebut three other comments and, and, and speak again, and I just spoke, I, I, I say this. I think everything that's been said leads you to we should have a, a two-tier system or we should separate industries in the patent system if you believe the government is imperfect. What I mean by that is if you think all we need is just a better patent office to, uh, to police patents better, to make sure that bad patents never come out, then all we need to do is throw a bunch of money at the patent office, get more examiners, more qualified examiners, and everything's going to be okay. And one of my clients, I, I, I actually said that once because, you know, I'm from Wisconsin, I like to believe in, in good government, even though, uh, even though all, experience, all experience in life has proven to be the contrary. <laughs> I said that once and he said, do you really think, I mean, do you have any experiences with the post office? Do you have any experiences with the government? Do you really think throwing more money at the patent office is going to solve this problem? And the answer is clearly it's not. And what that leaves us with is the social harm that, that my colleague on my right is talking about with the MPEs and, 
and, and the social benefit we're seeing with pharmaceutical and chemical patents or other industries we want to promote, and it leaves you inexorably with the idea that we need a policy-making body, that would be the United States Congress and the people acting through the Congress, to tell us where we care and where we don't. And I, I actually think this leads me to be even more enthusiastic about separating industries where we really care about innovation and industries where we think innovation is retarding progress. I, I gotta say, the notion that, that we can, that all of the, uh, the government is unreliable except in counting Congress to save us from the <laughs> <laughs> An, an, an interesting counterpoint. All right, it's, uh, now the audience has turned. There are a couple of microphones there, although some of you can also bellow, I guess, if you uh, would prefer. Um, I am uh, ready and willing to take comments. Some of them there, yes. Hi, my name is Derek Young, and I am an alumnus of the law school. Um, I have a question. Uh, you mentioned that you have a lot of people who are alumnus of the law school, Mr. Young. Uh, Mr. Mortara, what is the biggest downside of your proposed change? Um, for pharmaceutical patents? Yes. Um, I suppose the biggest downside would be that the FDA would get involved in micromanaging decisions about minor to moderate innovations and policing whether those would be recipients of the new 12-year exclusivity I propose. And the FDA is probably just as subject as the USPTO to the problems I alluded to, which also do impact Congress, although they are our, our government, yeah, as opposed to the administrative state, which is not. Uh, uh, I think that would be the biggest issue. I don't see that as one that, that really obliterates the benefits that I see of reducing the social harm of, of, uh, of investments that are made in, in hundreds of millions of one lost on, on bets on patents. Um, right now, we see a, little, see a little bit of bad behavior by pharmaceutical companies or perceived bad behavior by pulling certain versions of drugs from the market, putting another one on, trying to play this cat and mouse game with the generics. That's, I don't think anybody would argue that's socially efficient behavior. I think my proposal would probably get rid of it. So no, I, I, don't, I don't see tremendous downside. Yes, ma'am. My name is Jacqueline Wolf. Uh, thank you so much. I'm wondering if you could just touch on how closely aligned the U.S. Patent Office is with international offices. And though I didn't intend it to lead to pharmaceutical companies, I imagine this is an issue you probably have a lot with international pharmaceutical companies, but just in general. Well, now I'll answer first, no, not at all. Uh, they, they don't care what other patent offices do, and a U.S. court generally doesn't care what European patents do. And I think Phil is probably in a better position to answer exactly how the office works. That's a million dollar question. Um, I think that there are um, some practitioners who would say that while there's a lot of similarity between um, the goals of patent systems and in the way that they're implemented, that the examination process would be different. The quality of the examination might be different based upon where you have an application file and that some standards would be different. For example, the um, inventive step requirement in the European Patent Office is usually somewhat uh, more, I don't know if the right word is strict, or larger than incremental, which some folks have said the U.S. system um, has just incremental um, capability. Any other comments? Yeah, quick comment. Um, the reputation, I guess, in, in, among researchers in this area is that uh, Germany is uh, stricter. Uh, maybe Phyllis was alluding to that. Uh, one way you can see that is you can look at um, families of applications across the world and see that they are granted, claims will be granted more often in the US than they will be in Germany. So there's some evidence, but uh, the laws harmonize pretty closely around the world, and also, as Phyllis said, uh, the operation of the offices is not really so different. Um, so, you know, a question I've wondered about and don't have any answer at all to yet is to what extent a uh, notice failure is afflicting um, inventors operating you know, on, under the law of other countries. So, um, you know, I haven't uh, been able to learn what I'd like to in answer to that question. Okay, yes sir, over here. Hi. Uh, thank you. I have a question about patent litigation and its impact on uh, innovation, specifically the development of specialized courts, sort of by practice in the district courts in Texas and Virginia, for example, and then by law in the Federal Circuit. Uh, do you think that the development of these uh, sort of specialized courts and 
especially the federal circuit, which uh, has gotten sort of a reputation for its high reversal rate and innovative approach to the law, uh, whether they have a positive effect on um, promoting good patents and innovative, uh, like pro-innovation techniques, or do you think that agency capture or interest group capture? This is a funny uh, question, Jordan, uh, and, and I, uh, I guess I'd answer it by the basis of personal experience, and you're going to tell that I must have it wrong, because I'd say specialized courts at the trial court level are great. Uh, the District of Delaware is by far the best place to file a patent case, and it's a good place to defend one, too. We have four judges there, each with 500-plus patent cases. You walk into court and you say, this is a Jepson claim, they know what you're talking about. And I love it. At the same time, I've not been terribly pleased with the results in our specialist federal circuit. Uh, and that may be based on personal experience. So, <laughs> I, I must be wrong if I can't advocate for specialist courts in both places. So I defer to my co-panelists. Well, let me give you my two cents with um, it. It's a, it's a little bit like the issue of training for young lawyers when you go to a law firm. On the one hand, you want to have enough experience so you know that in a particular area so you know something. On the other hand, you don't want to be so narrow that you don't know anything else. What happened to the federal, the federal circuit is a terrible court. Um, <laughs> says the man who doesn't have to practice there. I, I did not say that. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, uh, my three biggest uh, victories, I'm most probably making new law when the federal circuit on behalf of the patent lawyers, but in any event, um, it's a captured court. And I don't think it's captured by interest groups in the way we think of you know, an administrative agency or a local government or whatever. It's captured by um, uh, intellectual tunnel vision. Uh, my anecdotal sense of talking to like judges and clerks on that court is that they actually think their task is to make the patent system as coherent and logically inconsistent, uh, logically consistent <laughs> uh, as possible without any regard to, to its, its relationship to, to the world outside. And um, I think that, that leads to disgrace. So it, it may be, I don't, I don't have the district court experience that, that Adam has. It may be that these experienced district court judges are better than the inexperienced ones because instead of doing 0.01% of their docket in, in patents, they do 5% of their docket in patents, and they know a little bit about it, but they're not narrow <coughs> specialists in lost all the Any other comments? Can, can, I, can I say that Doug was too kind? <laughs> <laughs> I have a colleague at the who's a prominent member of the Federal Society who uh, told me that he thought it was the Federal Circuit was a dumping ground for hacks. Oh, wait a minute. Well, I, 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 I would have to take some personal privilege on that. I was in the uh, Solicitor General's office uh, under Robert Bork as Solicitor General and First Deputy Dan Friedman, who was one of the finest uh, practitioners, and he was one of the first judges on the Federal Circuit. Uh, I'll, I'll, there may be a couple of other I know that could impress me a little I'll, bit. I'll withdraw my <laughs> I would, I'll say something more, though, and, 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 and this is important talking to law students who typically fetishize the Supreme Court of the United States, uh, I might have my own objections to whatever the, the Federal Circuit has done. The Supreme Court, 95% of the time, gets a hold of a patent case and messes it up. <laughs> I mean, and, and, and the Federal Circuit judges are doing the absolute best that they can, either operating within the constraint of trying to make everything wonderful or with the constraint of their own abilities or whatever it is, but the, the, the United States Supreme Court is doing a fantastically worse job. <laughs> Let, let, me, let me intervene on, on one thing, and that, uh, as I say, I, I know nothing on the substance, but I read a variety of recent sort of IP uh, Supreme Court cases, and maybe I only read a few and got them wrong, but what struck me most immediately was they were virtually all unanimous as to result, and then there were like four concurrences going four different ways. Is, is that part of what you had in mind? Uh, actually, I think the unanimous result is, is sometimes the problem. I mean. <laughs> The, the Federal Circuit at least has the benefit of seeing a lot of patent cases. I think what's gone on in the Supreme Court is we've got, we've got uh, Mr. and Ms. Fixits who think that there's this great big problem with, with NPE litigation out there, and they're going to fix it by harming patent holders any which way they can without regards to the consequences. I mean, eBay is, is sort of the beginning of it where they get rid of injunctions from a statute that says you have a right to exclude, but you don't really get an automatic injunction. What, what are we talking about? And then we end up with Alice which is incoherent mumbo jumbo and nobody can figure out what it means, but the district courts think what it means is there aren't software patents. And all you've got to say, all, all, you, all you've got to see is the number of Rule 12 101 motions that have been granted in the IT space, one by including me in a defense case. And, and you know that the district court message from that is we don't like software patents. 
So I, I just think it's, it's not being dealt with the delegacy that you would see from some of these a lot more serious. I, I would say that well, the, the opinions, particularly in Alice Knapp, that you may, may have been uh, in some respects in Felicitas. It's quite clear that the Supreme Court got the result right in those cases, unlike the federal system. <coughs> okay, anything else? Yes, sir, over here. Yes, uh, Nick Roberts, UVA Law. Uh, I have a comment and a question. Uh, first off, I'm not that confident, uh, some of the panelists, and that the government should be in charge of choosing what industries should be more or less innovative. Uh, it's, there's some concerning aspects of that. Um, and I'm also wondering what the panelists think about expanding uh, the doctrine of equivalence or the reverse doctrine of equivalence to reward invention inventors for what they actually contribute to the art. Well, as, a, as, as somebody who files, 90% of my work is claims patent work, I love the doctrine of equivalence, and it's the only place the Federal Circuit's been helping us recently. Um, I would say that Congress already does define what's patentable. It's in 35 United States Code, Section 101, so that ship sailed a long time ago. Any other comments on equivalence? Um, oddly, I also praise the Federal Circuit, but I, I, I'll praise them for um, uh, about a decade of skepticism for the doctrine of equivalence. So, um, I, the, the reason for their skepticism is notice, and they have called it out explicitly. So several federal circuit decisions relating to the doctrine of equivalence said that the public deserves better notice of the scope of the rights, and we are reluctant to apply the doctrine of equivalence, except when they have a very good case, such as later arising technology. Um, and uh, that was affirmed by the Supreme Court a story that says that if the patent prosecutor at the time of prosecution could not have foreseen this competitive technology, which falls within the scope of the invention, it's not claimed, that would be a good reason for application of the doctrine of equivalence. That makes sense to me. And uh, we should not give patent prosecutors a free ride anymore when they fail to foresee technologies that they could foresee fail to use language effectively, that's the job that, that you hire a lawyer to engage in. You know, lawyers should be finding the right language, they should be forecasting contingencies, they should be responding appropriately, and they shouldn't get a very strong insurance policy in the form of the doctrine of equivalence. Any other comments on equivalence? Okay, yes, please. Uh, Gene Meyer, Federal Society. I'm curious, historically, uh, how do, you think, how do you think the patent system is working now as opposed to how it has, as opposed to how it has been working? Are things getting better or worse, et cetera? Okay. Well, I, I think it's uh, better or worse, I think is hard. It's definitely different um, from the standpoint of, first of all, um, as been, has been mentioned extensively, the, um, the AIA and the new things that came along with the AIA, including the patent trials and the patent office. So um, there are those who would argue that it's well awry because so there's such a high invalidation rate. I don't know that I necessarily agree with that. I think we're just you know, a year into this, and so um, the office will have to find its way in that regard. Um, the examination process, I know there has been a lot of investment um, in the examination process overall. One thing is that there are more patent applications being filed, more and more and more and more. And so the question becomes, what can be done to uh, limit the load to the examiners? Because I do think that that affects um, the quality of the examination as well as the, the appropriate incentives. Um, I think, yeah, to restate what I was saying, I, I think the, uh, the patent system does not look as well uh, when you have what uh, Cal Shapiro has called a patent ticket, you know, 300,000 patents on a single cell phone, that's a relatively new development. So to that extent, the patent system is not working as well now as it did in the old days when the paradigmatic case was, uh, was the predominant one. Uh, one just brief thought on, uh, on the issue of patents that get challenged afterwards, either in the enterprise review or otherwise, or, and, and rebellion. That is not in and of itself uh, a symptom of anything bad. But given the, the, the huge number of patents that are being applied for, we wouldn't want a patent office that drilled down, had some kind of adversary proceeding, and ensured that it got the right result in 90% you know, of the cases. What we want is a relatively cursory determination of patentability, and then postponing until the, later in the day 
a drill down on those relatively few patents uh, that are worthy of that examination. Other, other comments on better or worse? Uh, in uh, the mid-80s, the patent system applied to technologies other than chem pharma was not harmful, and it has become harmful. So we're seeing a deterioration. I'll make a somewhat different comment, somewhat different question, not quite a question you're asked, but if you look around the world and you look at different periods of time, I think what economists see is that patent systems are hard to work with. It's hard to get them to work the way they should. There are some successes, there are more failures. Um, in 1850s, US patent systems were working pretty well. At the same time, the English patent system was working terribly. Um, for some industries, it's tended to work pretty well over time, but it's very sensitive to the nature of the technology, sensitive to the details. You've got to get these details right to get patents to really work as effective property rights. Yeah, I, I would tend to agree with my co-panelists. It's, it's probably worse. It's worse on my end because of litigation uncertainty with the Supreme Court constantly sending these these uh, love notes to the district courts to invalidate patents. Uh, it's, it, I say, I, I, I asked comments from some colleagues before I came here today, and one of them sticks out in my mind. He made some comparisons about intellectual property rights. This is after all a symposium about innovation. Some guy, high school dropout sitting in his basement can compose a song and get it copyrighted, and he gets, for, he gets copyrighted for his entire life plus 100 years. Really, you know, 20 years for a patent isn't that big. Nobody else. Uh, I, I, I did. I did have the feeling that uh, one of the, one of the reasons for Mr. Uh, for Mr. Mortera's uh, uh, rise in estimation is he's the only one that speaks almost as fast as Professor Epstein. No, 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 no. Adam was my student. He always put me to shame. Um, Except so, for my lowest grade in law school. Oh yes, I, richly deserved, I might add. <laughs> Blind grading, Adam. Blind grading. Um, no, I, I have a question for you, Adam. And, and, you know, because it's a very dramatic move that you make, saying knock out the patent system and use data exclusivity. Uh, but the question is really one, I think, of institutional imperfection. If you're going to run it through the FDA, you know, there are all sorts of other problems that exist. There are reluctance to grant any kind of protection to begin with, of the slowdown in the operation, the immense amount of stuff on clinical trials. And so the question that one wants to ask is, is there any way that you could reform the FDA so as to get rid of the delays that are associated with this operation? Um, and if you can't do that, the patent, of course, has no value. Uh, but if you don't do that, then, in effect, the exclusivity is not going to solve the entire problem either, because you still have the delay losses, which are very large. I think that the delay problems have been somewhat solved by the increased fees and their ability to collect fees, and, and I think you're seeing delay issues, at least on the brand side, are, have been ameliorated a little bit. Unfortunately, I, I hate to resort to, this is the problem money can solve because if we step up the FDA, they'll prove more out. Oh no, that's, that's clearly the wrong way. What you want to do is starve them to death, right? Okay. <laughs> Precisely, so that they have to just prove everything, and then we'll find out after the fact that they hurt people, the drugs hurt people. I mean, that's the, that's the terror, of course. I should say that before I came to law school and before I started practicing pharmaceutical patent law, everything I know about the healthcare system in the United States was written in a book called Mortal Peril by, the, uh, by uh, one of our questioners today, and everyone should go and read it. Who is that? Oh! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, ma'am, over here. Uh, I do have a follow-up question, and perhaps this is too bold to ask, but since we live in a globalized world today, uh, do you see a time in the near future when international patent offices will line up more exactly? Uh, and I ask that, for example, if an inventor in the EU wants to patent a product that they create in the US, which is first to file, which is phenomenal, um, but if they also want to patent this in other countries, which are not first to file, there starts to become an issue with their secret now not being secret. And if it's denied, that creates more problems. So perhaps you could just comment on, and perhaps it's also too bold to ask, but. So I'll take the cynical view first, which would be to say that no, because each one of these offices collects a number of fees, <laughs> quite frankly. And there's money affiliated with the patenting activities, with the territorial patent activities of the various examining authorities. I think the other is that to a certain extent, while there's a, a fair amount of 
harmonization around operations and various other things. There are um, differences in the patent uh, systems in various uh, ge geographies that sort of reflect the cultural norms of those in places. And so I think that governments will want to continue to have those things reflected in their patent system, even if those are values not accepted by a different examining authority. Yeah, I, I agree with both of the points. I would add a third. Um, you know, in, in uh, China, Brazil, some of the other emerging uh, countries, there are various kinds of, of assaults on intellectual property, you call it often under the, the uh, highfalutin term indigenous innovation, which is kind of euphemism for theft. Um, and, and if you look at, at, at U.S. history in the 19th century, we did the same thing. You know, we stole English patents. Uh, I think the moral of the story is have protect property and have not state. And until we're on a relatively equal economic plane, uh, I, it's hard to imagine we're going to actually do this on that. Any other comments on that point? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, they're over here. Hi, thank you very much uh, for all being here. I'll guys you guys to Chicago. Uh, my question is about <clears throat> non-practicing entities and the legislative attempts that are being used right now, in particular curbing litigation by MPEs. And I was curious if any of the panelists had comments about things that are effective or ineffective in that sphere, or is that something that Congress should be addressing at all? Effective or ineffective in curbing or in regulating? Or yeah, in, in, curb, in curbing litigation by curbed? MPEs. Yeah, should, be, should they be curbed, and if so, how? Maybe they should be curbed, but nothing that's being done is or will be effective. I do know that the pharmaceutical industry has managed to get itself exempted from a lot of the reforms, and in the current draft legislation that's before Congress is it's again exempt uh, for at least hatch waxman litigation. I don't, we all learned, or not we all, those of us who went to Chicago and took courts with Professor Letmore, Professor Epstein know that fee shifting is not going to make a difference uh, in terms of the number of cases that get filed or in terms of the social harms that are caused by bad cases. I think it should be curbed, and I don't think anything that we're doing is curbing. Other comments? Um, uh, I think um, the non-practicing entities, the trolls, whatever you call them, are opportunists to take advantage of more fundamental flaws in the patent system, including in particular the, the excessive rewards to patent holders that I was talking about earlier. Um, so I think the patent reforms ought to focus on the patent system, not on the trolls, with one exception. And then, although I still wouldn't do it by naming the trolls, but trolls are much more inclined than, than practicing entities to engage in abusive practices, you know, fraudulent letters that the user is saying you actually owe a world and you're smart phone in your pocket and so forth. Uh, because they don't have the reputation concerns, I suppose, that practicing entity has. And the law ought to, I think, um, uh, you know, be pretty vigorous against that kind of abusive practice, but not because it's done by a troll, but because it's an abusive practice. Um, first of all, I agree with um, Professor Melvin concerning um, abusive practices relative to, in particular, claim letters, which seems to be a big problem, or at least seems to get a lot of press as being a big problem. Um, certainly, you know, the excessive papering of the universe with tenuous claim letters is inappropriate behavior, no matter who does it. The, one of the uh, challenges, however, is to when people say non-practicing entity, patent assertion entity, what exactly do they mean by that? It's not clear. And it is, for example, a so-called operating company who enforces patents outside of its core space where it's not practicing those patents. Is that a non-practicing entity? I would say perhaps. Right? Um, I think the other is, is that the government should not be in the business of determining which business models are successful and which are not. Any, any other questions? The crowd's getting a little bit of Sorry. No, yeah. I went for a um, I, I'm largely in agreement with the other panelists. I, I want everyone to notice that um, a large portion of lawsuits brought by MPEs, which I think are harmful, were lawsuits that previously, that is to say before 2005, were brought by practicing entities. So these lawsuits have migrated from practicing entities to non-practicing entities because they are often more effective in bargaining, um, subject to qualifications that Doug has written about. Uh, second point, I think we've heard everyone on the panel say, is that in addition 
to the bad kinds of lawsuits associated with notice failure, we have the bottom feeder trolls, is a term that's commonly used. That's a new breed of patent lawsuit. And, and I just use the word lawsuit I probably shouldn't have, because bottom feeders rarely file the lawsuit. So the reforms that have, people have made positive comments about are mostly designed to address something that is close to fraud. And there's probably a significant amount of that activity out there. And um, one last thing I, I, I will put on my wish list is I wish, con and this will be unpopular I suppose, but I wish Congress would give substantive rulemaking authority to the PTO. The PTO is in a good <laughs> position, <laughs> is in a good position to more thoughtfully address a lot of these problems. Um, yes, sir. That kind of rolls into my question. Nice segue, thank you. This is from Mr. Mantara, I think. Um, I worked in medicine for 30 years, and um, one of my, and listening to you brings the frustration in the congressional and the political realm to achieve changes and, and the goals of making this better for social good, which it seems to me what people don't understand outside of the legal world or the healthcare world. With pharma, for example, you hear the buzzwords about how they make millions, the pharma's going to make millions of dollars, and then, especially with HIV and the cost of HIV drugs and, and how they're so expensive here and how they're so cheap elsewhere. How do we get the, how do we, pharma get their sort of image, um, do, how do we improve that? I'm not sure what my exact question really is about the congressional aspect of trying to achieve these goals and, and the perception of the public and the vilification of pharma versus what really is going on, which is quite good. I guess what I would say in defense of big pharma is, um, and, and if you believe that the United States needs to be a force for moral good in the world, we are in the sense that we subsidize the rest of the world's drugs. Drugs are expensive here because they're price controlled almost everywhere else, and drug companies have to get back their fixed and capital costs to justify their very risky investments, otherwise we should just go and invest in the S&P 500, which is less risky. So uh, I think that the, the demonization of drug companies here and, and, and the proposition that we would have price controls here, or now that the government's in charge of you know, three quarters of the healthcare system, that the government would use its power to reduce the prices it would pay for drugs would have a cataclysmic effect on the pharmaceutical industry. And for everybody complaining about the price of some new great treatment, whether it's for HIV or, or another uh, uh, terrible disease, uh, there's a satisfied patient who gets that treatment and who feels better. And at the end of the day, uh, I think the best thing we could do is get out there and support Big Pharma. And big, the best thing Big Pharma could do is to stop doing what I call um, the, the, ineff the, the inefficient gaming of the system. And I hate to pick on anybody, but Claritin and Clarinex, you know, they're exactly the same. And, and, every, and, and I think that's not one of my clients, I can say that. <laughs> it, it isn't now. This <laughs> <laughs> is off the record, off the record. Big Pharma did its share of, of circular firing squad to, to, to land itself in this position. I think that's fair to say. Um, all right, other, other folks, we've been doing very well on time. Is there anybody else? Because we're going to close it down. For yes, I. Uh, I don't have much of a background in patent law, so I didn't want to keep someone who understood things better than me answering. But um, uh, Russell Ward, University of Notre Dame. I came in here not uh, kind of wondering why intellectual property should be substantively treated differently from all other property interests. And Professor Muir's um, uh, notice. Uh, difference uh, really uh, answered that for me. And so I wanted to ask the panel what their thoughts on how we could make the notice of these property rights clearer. We heard some interspersed remarks about a very specific pattern, patents separating industries or limiting it by foreseen applications of the patent uh, filer. Uh, I'd just like to open that up to the panel. Thank you. I have a million answers, I'll just give you one. All right. um, until last year, the standard in our patent law, section 112B, related to clarity of claim language, the law said that uh, ambiguity of claim language does not matter as long as some judge can figure out some preferred meaning. Uh, the, the term that the court used, the federal circuit used, was insolubly ambiguous. Unless a claim term is insolubly ambiguous, um, it, it's okay. 
Supreme Court uh, in Nautilus versus Biosig has beefed up the claim definiteness standard a bit. It remains to be seen how that will be implemented by the courts. Um, I really hope that the PTO takes that as a signal that part of their obligation in examining patents is to look for vague and ambiguous language and try to root it out. I'd love it if we would induce patent applicants to speak more about what their claims mean. They hate that. They don't want to provide a roadmap to infringers, but I would call that just greater clarity in property rights, creation of safe harbors. I think that's desirable. And I think that inventors that have significant inventions have nothing to fear. You get a significant invention, you're going to get a broad patent right, no matter how rigorous we are in demanding good notice be provided. One reason I think um, some patent holders like vague uh, patent claims is that it gives them a plausible claim for a broader range of applications, uh, which is very valuable if they're being rewarded excessively uh, by the young One thing that um, there's been a lot of discussion about that probably has some value is um, working to establish a common lexicon with regard to certain inventions and certain inventive spaces. Um, one of the many challenges I'm sure the patent of I have, I read patents every day, and I can read patents on similar subject matters that use entirely different vocabularies. Um, and I think that would help towards more certainty around um, what a claim, what the claim means, what the scope is, so forth and so on. And, and I, I guess I'd add, uh, your question reminded me of a conversation I had with Professor Epstein several years ago in an idea that he thoroughly hated. And, <laughs> and it, it was that you, you talk about treating patents as the same as we treat other types of property, and then we hear about changes that courts make to how we read patents. And, and I think to myself, yeah, that's great, except for you know, what if you wrote a, a DNA patent, you were trying to get a real invention patent, you just happened to write it in the wrong way, and then the Supreme Court comes out with myriad. And boy, don't you wish you could have had a VA gone back in time and written your patent claim the right way, because he actually did have something patentable. And I, I really object to the Federal Circuit and the Supreme Court invalidating thousands upon thousands upon thousands of patents with the stroke of a pen in cases like Myriad or Alice or others. And I've, I've long been holding in the back of my head the idea that, and this will be, you guys will love this, that the Federal Circuit should, should create, and the, and the Supreme Court should create something like the Teague versus Lane Doctrine for patent law which is to say the Federal Circuit cre can create new rules of patent law only on direct review from the patent office in an examination and cannot create new rules of patent law in cases involving litigation. And that would include new rules of claim construction. So that patents that have been granted by the United States government are property. And I think if the Supreme Court and the Federal Circuit change the scope of those property rights after the fact, and this is what Professor Epstein really had, I said, that's a taking. <laughs> yes, sir. James Nelson, Harvard Law School. Uh, this question is probably mostly for Adam, but on the litigation side of things, speaking of the Supreme Court and Federal Circuit, uh, I wonder that the recent Supreme Court case of Take Pharmaceuticals that just came down, uh, I wonder if you see that more of just sort of another love note from the Supreme Court to the, to the lower district courts, or what effect you see uh, the change in standard of review for the Federal Circuit on patent law more generally? That's the exception that proves the rule. Uh, I, I'm, I love it. I think it's fantastic. I think it's right. I think uh, the, the obsession with the NOVA review of claim construction was, was a real problem. I think the, the love note aspect of it is it's really to the Federal Circuit stop reversing all the time. And I think it's going to have some negative effects uh, in, in district court practice. In, just to give you all this some history, you know, in, in the early part of my practice in the early 2000s, we were in an era where we would have little mini claim construction trials with witnesses who would testify what the claims mean. And that really ended with the Federal Circuit's en bloc decision in Phillips, which kind of put, put ex, what we call extrinsic evidence to the side. I think it's coming back in a big way. I'm, I'm getting proposed scheduling orders from opponents now that build in testimony time for experts. And I think we're going to see little mini trials about what patents mean. Other comments on this one? Yes, ma'am. Alexandra Harrison from the University of Texas. My question is, um, going back to the original conception of property law we alluded to earlier, would there be any space for an analogy to easements? And if so, what would that look like? Sort of, you don't own it, but you get to use it anyway. Question on easements, adverse possession? <laughs> I'm not sure. I, I, in general, I think it's much better to 
think about legal problems sort of logically, not analogically. But um, uh, I, I want to use two thoughts. The comment was made earlier about what's, what's different about patents. It's not just the uncertainty. There's something else different about patents. If I own Yellow Acre, um, I can uh, possess it and I can keep you, subject to an easement, from coming onto it. If I own a patent, the you know, name of the patent on Yellow Acre, I can prevent you from mimicking it 30,000 miles away. Well, not 30,000, but 3,000 miles away. <laughs> um, uh, so it has a kind of reaching out quality that's quite different. I think you could, you could look at the infringer, the innocent infringer in my province, as having an easement. Any other questions? Yes, please. Other comments on that? No. I would just say that potentially, um, not completely analogous to, analogous to an easement, but in some jurisdictions there is a concept of compulsory licensing, which means that if you're not working your patent in particular, um, that if there is someone who is using it, you are uh, obliged to license it. Um, that does not address the terms, uh, of course, of the terms of the license and in terms of the cost of that. Okay, yes, sir. Hi, uh, Peter Kiros. So we've been kind of talking about how the scope of the claims is not necessarily known until we start getting litigation. Um, and I'm not as familiar with the new IPR and PGR uh, standards of the AIA, but would it make sense to, for the PTO to take some sort of a mini Markman hearing and have some sort of scope laid out when you issue a patent? I, I guess what I'd say is, deferring again this term grim, uh, they're, they're already so busy. Um, I think one objection to which your question alludes is they use a different standard yeah. for construction of the claims than district courts do. And I think that is a serious that is a serious problem. And they shouldn't. Yeah, I would have to agree with Adam on that. I think the, the core of some of the issues is that the Patent Office uses the broadest yeah. reading of interpretation for the claim versus what the courts would use in interpreting the claim. I won't advocate um, the Markman hearing we're describing, but I, I actually like the difference between the courts and the PTO. Um, you know, the broadest reasonable interpretation standard, which is used at the PTO, um, possibly gives a broader read to claims than what the court would settle on. Uh, the difference in the two settings is that you have plenty of opportunities to amend those claims while you're still in the agency. Um, and there is now a question about what latitude should they have to amend in the, in the post-grant review process and, and these other administrative processes. I'm not sure what the answer is there, but I, I don't shed too many tears for patent owners that get the benefit of the doctrine of equivalence, they get the chance to do a reissue, they get the chance to have many different patents issuing on the same invention. They, while one patent is, is at the PGR process, they might have another patent still in the patent office. So there are lots of different opportunities for gaming claim language. Um, and the DAC is currently stacked in favor of the applicant slash owner. I want to also make a comment. I put this slide up when Phyllis was talking about uh, taxonomy because you see the result of the uh, International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry having a taxonomy. So the problems that Phyllis was talking about and that we've all talked about with regard to, for example, software technology, where there are lots of different terms used by similar coders in similar settings. You know, this is a, one of the many reasons why things work better for chemicals, is that we do have an agreed upon nomenclature. Okay, we're coming very close. Um, I just uh, want to ahead. say sure. one more thing, because I just, I just can't resist. And that is that while there are many opportunities for patent tees to amend claims in various proceedings, I would say there are equally, if not more, opportunities for infringers or alleged infringers to invalidate those patents through process, through a number of processes. So I don't know that the thumb is on the scale one way or the other in that regard. Amen. Let me just remind you, I don't understand why you would want to have a system which a patent office would use criteria different from the criteria that are ultimately going to be governed, governing the court. All that does is create uncertainty and a recipe for more of the kind of hagging that Phyllis was talking about. I think those standards will be aligned. Professor Epstein, very short. No, <laughs> beyond my capabilities. I wanted to ask my <laughs> about the doctrine. I mean, there's nobody else on the line, so I'll put myself in the caboose. Um, 
I think you're much too harsh on the doctrine of equivalence. And, and let me see if I can explain theoretically why I think it's the case. Um, there is nobody in the patent space, either a plaintiff or a defendant, who wears a white hat with all the other guys wearing black hat. What's happened is everybody wants to game everything. And so if we knock out the doctrine of equivalence, it means that we increase the odds that somebody takes an invention or re-engineers it in some modest way and then puts it forward. And essentially, it's a theft of labor of somebody who comes in there. If, on the other hand, we read the thing too broadly under the circumstances, then it has preclusive effects over a space in which people haven't done it. So, I mean, it seems to me that to simply treat this as though it's a kind of a mistake in some sense, or that notice ought to be the dominant situation, is probably incorrect. The, the, the doctrine of equivalence, as it's been currently applied, is probably right. Um, it is, as we say all the time in contracts, impossible for people at an early stage in an invention or development to have complete foresight of all permutations. That down the road, other people will come along with the benefit of the information that's been included in the income, and that they will be able to sort of put the situation in a way which will be for their maximum advantage. And I think what the doctrine of equivalence is designed to do, properly apply, is to recognize that the opportunism on the part of potential infringers is equally important with overclaiming on the part of the plaintiffs. Okay, the plaintiffs. Thank, thank you. Uh, <laughs> I want to know if you think no, that's right. the, Well, we're, we're coming to the end. Is there anybody, is there anybody that well, wants to... Let me just say one thing. I'm really glad to hear that Professor Epstein has made clear that he would reject the current pending challenge to the Obamacare bill. <laughs> no, well, no, 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 no. No, <laughs> That is beyond cheap, right? Well... <laughs> And completely there, wrong. Chicago, in Chicago, we believe cheap tricks should be used no, first no, 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 before no, no, expensive no. tricks. No, 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 no. The no, doctrine of equivalence says... Okay, Richard, explain. enough. Enough. Yes. All right. We, we, understand, we understand that he likes the doctrine of equivalence. Is there anybody who wants to take a last shot on the other side briefly? And then I'll wrap up. I think I was invited to take a last shot. <laughs> briefly. So, comment number one. Um, the filters the Federal Circuit has created give defendants a chance to win at the summary judgment stage. Very desirable. Doctrine of equivalence always goes to the jury. That's a big problem. Second, applicants can have many, many claims. You get to choose a hundred different versions of your claim. It's, it's not like a contract setting. It's not like a deal setting. I can go out and I can write all the different kinds of sentences I want. One of them should be right if I've got the real invention. Uh, third, you can always go to reissue, and in two years you can get a broadening reissue. Fourth, you have a family of patent claims pending. Uh, when you see technology developing, you can write claim language on the new technology that has developed. Okay, thank you. Um, to, to summarize, we, we have one or two minutes left, and I'll, I'll summarize. We've really had a wonderful panel in terms of the different things that might be right or wrong with the current system. Seemed like each person had a reform or two that they thought might be good. I even I was shocked to hear uh, Professor Epstein say something about maybe we can reform the FDA. Uh, his first reform I may have heard him in favor of. Uh, I guess I, I'm old-fashioned. There was a wonderful man named Roscoe Conklin, who was a senator from New York, a great spoilsman in the 19th century, and, and he was quoted as saying. You know, there is a statement that patriotism is the last refuge of a scoundrel, but that man had not considered the possibilities of reform. <laughs> so that may be my cynical view. Let's first thank the panel.